idolatrous form of Baptist that you will find, and that is Calvinist, okay? Now, every Calvinist that would hear this message think, how dare you? How dare you? That is a railing accusation. We are not, you know, I don't... Hello, Jeff Dollar here, coming to you from Coal Country, Pennsylvania. I'd like to answer some accusations uh, from Pastor Tom McMur McMurtry concerning the issue of idolatry and Calvinism. Uh, now, for one thing, I would have to be in total agreement that everybody has an issue with idolatry. It doesn't matter what denomination or, or even if you're a Christian. Uh, the uh, issue of idolatry creep, creeps up in the fallen heart of man all the time. You know, even John Calvin, one of those dead men that we talk about, uh, said that man is a factory of idols, uh, that he's an idol factory, that he's constantly producing idols. That's, we're always battling against that. You know, that you can make the church your idol. You, you can make the Bible your idol if you look at it the wrong way. So uh, we have to admit, yes, we, of course, have an issue with idolatry, as does everyone else. So that's not the issue. But what I'd like to look at is some of these specific things that he points out, and we'll make a few comments as we go. You know, I don't, well, listen, if you're worshiping man, I consider you an idolater, okay? If you are a man worshiper, you're an, you're an idolater as far as I'm concerned. And I believe the Calvinists by far Ex exceed all groups of Baptists when it comes to being idolatrous and worshiping men. I say, well, how do they do that? Well, first off, they constantly lift up dead men. You know, we want to we want to talk to these people about what the Bible says, and then what do they always want to do? They want to quote Spurgeon. They want to quote John Calvin. They want to quote Martin Luther. They want to quote all these reformers. What is it that they're constantly telling us? You know, here we are. We'll get them and preach a message from the Bible. Just use scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. And then what do they do? They want to go to church history. They want There's a couple things I'd like to point out in this section of his video. Uh, one is that uh, to be able to go into the recesses of the heart of another individual and make a judgment and say that you are worshiping a man because you quote a man, I think is going beyond the scope of human ability. Now, we're warned about that. There's an interesting story in the story of, of David and Goliath. Remember, David went to the battlefield to deliver his cheeses and bread for his brothers. And uh, in the process of that, uh, he heard the story of, of Goliath, and he was asking what, what's going to be the reward for the one who kills the giant uh, and uh, basically saying, I want to do this. His brother, his oldest brother, steps up and uh, says a couple of things. Let me just read here. See if I can find that. Uh, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Of course, David's response was, uh, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? So Eliab, his oldest brother, thought that he would be able to discern the hypocrisy, not the hypocrisy, but the uh, pride and insolence of David's heart. That, he said, that's why you came down. Of course, that wasn't why. He thought he could read David's heart, but he couldn't. Uh, one of the reasons I left this branch of fundamentalism was the ability of some, so they thought, to look into the hearts of others and discern their motives. You know, so if we're quoting men, we're quoting dead men in our apologetics, uh, that would that makes us idol worshipers. That we're worshiping these men. Now, here's the problem with that. To quote somebody uh, as an example or as an authority uh, does not mean that you're usurping the authority of the Bible or that you're exalting these people above simply being uh, good teachers or human beings or good examples. You know, if you go to the average Calvinistic church, I'm talking about a, a conservative biblical church, uh, anybody can, can put the label of Calvinism on their teaching and still and be just as any other church, you know, with all of the rock and roll and the lights and, and the, the uh, drama and all that. I'm not talking about those kind of churches, but a, a conservative, uh, 
a fundamental, I guess you'd say, Calvinistic church, uh, and you listen to the preaching, they're not going to be spending hours of time extolling the virtues of Luther or Calvin or Zwingli or any of these guys. Now, we refer to them as teachers. Uh, we can uh, we can benefit from their example and some of their exposition. That's why we quote from them. Uh, but uh, we don't exalt them. Uh, we don't put them up in the place of the Bible or up in the place of anybody else. We recognize them to be sinners as we are. Uh, so that's not that's not the issue. Uh, and I think you need to discern between apologetics and biblical preaching. Now, the reason that I, for example, would quote, and, and at, the, at the introduction of this, I have a list of, of pictures of Calvinists of the past just to remind us where we've come from and the examples that we have. John Bunyan, for example, pr produced the book Pilgrim's Progress. John Fox produced Fox's Book of Martyrs. We have we have some pictures of the martyrs in there. So uh, what's the reason for that? Uh, we can learn from the examples of the past. Let me just read. This is a response I gave to Mr. McMurtry in one of his comments on another video that I produced. If you can't find decent people in the past that held your positions, I'm talking about your theological positions. If you can't find a noble army of martyrs who believe the way you do, perhaps there's a reason. If dedicated, sincere, sacrificial, gifted men of the past rejected your position, and you can only find it among the Pelagian heretics of the past, it should be cause for concern. This is the attitude of the cultist. Joseph Smith, Charles Russell, Mary Baker Eddy, and others all thought they had a monopoly on truth, that God had especially blessed only, their, only them or only their movement. They disdain the past as well. All creeds are an abomination. That's a quote from Joseph Smith. Now, he couldn't stand the creeds. He said, oh, we don't need the creeds. Well, he didn't like the creeds because they exposed his error. It is not, uh, it is not worshiping men. It's learning from the teachers God has blessed the church with in the past. And if you go to Ephesians 4.11, uh, it talks about gifts that Jesus gave to his church for the edification of his church. Among them are teachers. Now, these teachers, some of them have left us some very wonderful works, expositions of scripture, expositions of theology that we can learn from. Let me continue with my response here. That's my concern with your new and improved brand of fundamentalism. It's not a spiritual thing to disdain those <coughs> who have paved the way and attempted to cut a path for the church to follow. It's foolish and always leads to disaster. <clears throat> now, we, we're not to consider ourselves so smart that we have no need of the wisdom of teachers of the past. We should not be quick to throw those under the bus you know, that have suffered, who have studied, who have learned, who have provided a foundation for us to build upon. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, What makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Now, where did you get your information? Uh, where, did, where did your heritage come from? No, uh, we're, we don't, we're not to think that, that uh, we are the epitome of all knowledge, that we have no need of those who went before us. Now, that, that is a grave error and uh, much... Uh, and so I think it's a danger uh, that we ought to avoid. Church history. They want to go to church fathers. And then what do they do? They try to tell us, you know, what you all are teaching, it's brand new. Really? I got it out of my 1611 right here. Yeah, but what you're saying about it, well, you'll find out as we go and we read these commentaries by this person, we read these commentaries by all these dead guys that none of them agree with what you're saying. None of that. Well, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And what do they do? They don't go and refute it with scripture. They go to commentaries. You, you will never find a Calvinist. You, I mean, I challenge you to go read a Calvinist book and not find just, I mean, multiple 
multiple just quotes from Spurgeon and whoever, they, they idolize these people. They quote these guys like we quote the Bible. And even in the old This does bring up an interesting point. What about commentaries? What kind of authority do we place upon commentaries? Well, commentaries are simply the work of other men who have studied the scripture, who have come up with certain conclusions. Uh, they have access perhaps to other works uh, which are helpful. I, I found that some commentators will delve into the scriptures, uh, other parts of the Bible and put them together for you. Uh, they will uh, may perhaps have access to older commentaries which aren't in print anymore. Uh, so uh, they're helpful. Uh, we don't open up a commentary and say, this is what, it, what the, 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 uh, the text is teaching. No, we open up a commentary to assist us. It's a way to help us as we go through and analyzing the scripture and we come up with certain conclusions. And if you can't find those conclusions anywhere else, you know, oh, wow, that means I'm a really smart guy and I figured this out that nobody else has figured. No, if it hasn't been figured out already by much greater minds than ours, then it's probably not true. You know, years ago, uh, I was an assistant pastor uh, in, in a large church in Maryland. And I was along with, uh, there was two other assistant pastors, uh, two, one, uh, my, myself on one full-time, another part-time. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, we found out that the pastor, the senior pastor had died. And it was, a, it was a, a, an emergency type of situation. It was a sudden, it was during Bible school. Uh, we were in the midst of a Bible study on Wednesday evenings, and it was a walk through the Bible. You know, we started at Genesis and started working our way through, and he was the one teaching on Wednesday nights. Now, suddenly that was thrust upon me and this other pastor. Well, it so happened that when the pastor died, he died right at the end of the study in Revelation. And I didn't feel at that time I was qualified to teach uh, it through Revelation, especially. I was going through some theological changes and, and struggles, uh, and the other pastor said, I'm not touching it. <laughs> You're going to have to do it. So what I determined to do was to use commentaries as a help, but I was not going to use any commentaries that were less than about 150 years old. Now that limited me to Matthew Henry, John Gill, uh, Matthew Poole, and some of the others who were, were, were uh, older than the 19th century. And the reason I did that is because of dispensationalism. I felt that the dispensationalism was a new interpretation, so I wanted to avoid that. Any teacher that had been uh, affected by that teaching, I wanted to avoid, just to see what these other men uh, taught on Revelation. And I found a, a very interesting opinions there, and it, it kind of left me, I wasn't prepared at the time to develop uh, my eschatology. I had actually thrown out my old eschatology and decided I was going to rebuild uh, but I, I learned a lot of different positions from that uh, by going to these commentators. I didn't take a commentator and say, this man is authoritative just as the Bible. That would be idolatry. But they were helps to me. Now, if my particular position was not in any of those commentaries, I would question my position. You know, some of these men had spent many years in heavy study of the scripture. And these uh, were not just academic men, they were spiritual men. These are men who had paid a price. You think of Matthew Henry, I believe it was his father uh, had paid a severe price for standing uh, for the scriptures. Uh, it was during the time of, I think it may have been Charles I or Charles II, there was a persecution going on and he lost his church, lost everything. Uh, it was Matthew Henry had, had dealt with that with his father. Uh, so you, you get the picture. They're, these were spiritual men. If they can't come up with a position, if it's brand new, well, then there's, there's usually something wrong with it. Another thing, another thing to consider, if something is brand new, if something is not in the commentators, uh, anybody can say, I believe the Bible. Every cult says that, that I didn't get my teaching from anybody else, I got it directly from the Bible. Well, the Bible is an intricate and complicated book. You have to be able to compare Genesis to Revelation every, and every book in between. You have to have a good sound knowledge of the entire Old Testament. When you get to the New Testament, you need to be able to interpret things in the New Testament in the light of the Old Testament. You need to be able to take the law of God and compare that to the New Testament application of the law of God. What is the law of God? Uh, many people just read the Bible and say, oh, I believe the law of God is something I need to keep in order to be saved. 
Yeah, well, the, the New Testament tells us exactly what the law of God is for us. It, it is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We're to look at the law of God. Uh, we apply the law of God. We can't keep the law of God, so therefore we need something else, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all, all of these concepts are very deep and intricate. It involves knowing the cultures of each book when it was written, the language, the backgrounds, all of these things, the histories. So many times we don't have an extensive knowledge of this. We go to the commentaries. And the commentaries, some of these men are specifically uh, trained in certain areas, original languages or church history or, or biblical history, and they can help us through this. So, and a, a knowledge of historical theology is very helpful when it comes to, to this. You know, when you, you look at the positions that, that's taken in some of these offshoot uh, groups and fundamentalism, such as Mr. McMurtry's, uh, you'll find these positions among the, the heretical groups, the, the heretical offshoots of the Christian church, and whether it be with the Libertines or it could be with the Pelagians or the Antinomians. If you know a little bit of church history, and I'd recommend reading uh, Cunningham's Historical Theology. It comes in two volumes. It takes a while to get through it, but it's well worth it. Uh, if you read through that, and you'll see some of the doctrines that are taught, that the issues with the Trinity, the issues with repentance, uh, the, the issues uh, with uh, works after salvation, things like that. Uh, you'll find these positions. It's not new. It's not, not, but it's not being held by Orthodox Christians. It's not new, but it's old heresies. You know, they go back uh, to ancient times or Reformation times or among some of the Munsterites of the, the Reformation era, some of these Anabaptists. Now, if you know Anabaptist history, uh, a lot of times you don't want to be claiming your roots of, go back to these guys. Some of these were just rank heretics. Uh, some of them were polygamists uh, and, and other things, but, but you'll find... Some of these doctrines actually have their beginnings in some of these groups. You know, so they're not brand new. It's just they're new to Orthodox Christianity. They've been around uh, hundreds of years many times or longer. Uh, and so they're not new. It's just that they're new to those who claim to be fundamentalists. Bible.